And I am, like I said before, so happy to have Liza with us to present today. To share a little bit of background, Liza is the Director of Education and Quality at Edible Squared NYC. She oversees curriculum, instruction, and professional development, manages the fee-for-service program, and works with the evaluation team to measure an organ the organization's impact. And so with that, thank you so much, Liza. I'll pass it to you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, it's really nice to be here. Um, thank you guys all for joining. Um, and thank you so much, Russell, and also to the whole Edible Schoolyard Project in Berkeley for including me today. Um, as Russell said, this, this session is called Orienting Instruction to Support Social Emotional Learning. And I'm Liza Engelberg, Director of Education from Edible Schoolyard NYC. Um, could you do the next slide, please, Russell? Thank you. So today we'll do a little more welcome and introductions. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about the Edible Schoolyard NYC programming. We'll talk a little bit about some basic definitions of social emotional learning, uh, what it is um, and why we came to it as a program. I'll give you some examples of social emotional learning in our garden and kitchen classrooms. Um, and then we'll put you guys into breakout rooms to talk about your own practice and ideas that you might be working on. Um, and then come back for larger group Q&A at the end. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you guys already said where you're from, but if you don't mind repeating yourself, I would just love to see your name, where you live. If you're a teacher, what you teach. Um, and if you're not a teacher, what's your connection to cooking and gardening education? Um, and if you don't mind just typing that in the chat and we can all sort of see a little bit more about who's in the room, that would be amazing. Wow, what an interesting diversity of experience and places that you guys are. It's really great to see. I really appreciate um, finding out a little bit more about you. I'm gonna pause for questions a few different times during the presentation and we are gonna do a Q&A at the end. Oh, hey, Miriam, uh, my colleague is here. Um, and if, and if, you, if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand or come off mute. We will pause a few times during the presentation and there will be, I think, a good amount of time at the end for some Q&A. So if I haven't hit on something, that you're hoping to hit on, please don't be shy about asking. Um, all right, next slide, please. Um, let's do a, an SEL introduction um, in addition to the one we just did. If you guys were in my classroom and we were face-to-face, -face, I would just ask you something very simple, which is to show me with your thumb how you're doing. I'd say, if you're doing good today, give me a thumbs up. If you're not so great, give me a thumbs down. If you're in, meh, you can give me a thumbs sideways. Um, so yeah, you can do it in the chat. I don't know if the chat allows for a thumb sideways. So if you're really advanced and can do an emoji, fantastic. If you're like me and not so advanced, you can just say thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. But let's just do a little pulse check and see how everyone's doing today. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of happy thumbs up. So how very nice. And you guys are good at emojis. A sideways, okay. I don't know how to do a sideways. Not, I spent some time looking for one on the internet, did not get very successful. Um, this is a really simple SEL activity that we do with our students. Ooh, a fist. I like it. Wow. Okay. Um, I like doing it in person. I like doing it so that all kids can do it together uh, for a couple different reasons. One is it's participatory for everyone all at once. So for a kid who's a little bit impatient, doesn't like sitting around listening to other people, it's, it's very participatory for everyone at the same time. Uh, as a teacher, it allows us to see how our kids are doing. And if you get some thumbs down, that's something you might wanna keep an eye on. You can, you can check in with the students who give you an indication that they're not doing great. Um, and I'm gonna share this activity with you later as part of a larger lesson. You can also ask them again at the end of class. If anything changed, they can give you their thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways at the end and see how the class affected them. Um, next slide, please. I also just wanted to mention, um, that this idea came that we I saw an idea this version done a little more elaborately at the Edible Schoolyard of New Orleans. Um, I'm going to talk more about them later because they've been incredibly helpful to us in developing our social emotional learning work. 
Um, but when I was had the opportunity to visit the Edible Schoolyard in New Orleans several years ago, I observed this activity where students received a tasting when they entered the room. Unfortunately, I do not remember what the tasting was, but it was on a spoon. Um, after they eat their tasting, they are invited to put the spoon in a cup that has an emoji on it, a smiley face, a frowny face, or a neutral face. And that is, instead of the thumbs up, thumbs down, how they can indicate their mood. And then at the end of class, if they felt that their mood changed, they can move the spoon from the cup they put it in to the different cup. So this is a cool one too, um, a little more work to set up, but kind of fun. What's better than starting class with a tasting? Um, but the thumbs up, thumbs down is, is easy if you just want a really quick, simple way to do it. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Edible Schoolyard NYC. So um, I did, you know, of course, wanted to thank the Edible Schoolyard of Berkeley for inviting me today, but I also need to thank them just for our very existence. We um, were founded in 2010 in the model of the original Edible Schoolyard project in Berkeley. Um, our board chair really was inspired by the program and wanted to bring it to the children of New York City. Um, so we began in 2010 at a single elementary school in Gravesend, Brooklyn. And um, now this year we have expanded to having um, seven full-time teachers, it, or rather full-time teachers in seven schools around New York City. Um, and then in the last two years, we've expanded a little further to doing fee-for-service work so that we have a somewhat smaller presence in an additional nine schools around the city. Um, and in addition to that, we do work like I'm doing today where we occasionally do workshops where we invite folks either in New York City if they're um, live workshops or from all, all around, um, if virtual, to, to come and talk more about this cooking gardening practice that we do. So we do some professional development as well. Um, so our, our mission is to provide hands-on education for several purposes. We wanna deepen students' academic understanding. We wanna support their social emotional learning as we'll talk more about today. And we want to empower students to be active participants in their local communities and beyond. The primary way we do this is through hands-on cooking gardening classes that happen during the school day. So kids come to us the way they would go to their math class or go to their gym class. Um, depending on the size of the school, we might see them once a week once every two weeks or once every three weeks. And um, in addition to the teaching, we do some family and community programming um, and some cafeteria interventions as well. Next slide, please. So when we started in 2010, we had a fairly singular focus and that focus was um, using hands-on cooking and gardening classes to help students make healthier food choices. Um, this is not something that we have abandoned or stopped believing in. Um, but, and, and I, I use a quote that I really like from the activist Ron Finley, if kids grow kale, they eat kale. If kids grow tomatoes, they eat tomatoes. We still really believe that. And I, the part I added as a paraphrase is if they grow and cook the kale, they're gonna eat it. Um, but we have moved a little bit beyond the singular outcome for a few different reasons. Um, and one of them is to do the social emotional learning that we're gonna talk about today. Um, next slide, please. So there's sort of three reasons that we moved beyond just talking about individual food choice for students. I would say the first is, you know, as we developed a better understanding of the problem, it became more and more apparent that it was much more of a food system issue than a, an issue of individual um, choice of students. Um, the statistic that I'm sharing with you, not a very happy one, is about New York City. Um, if you're familiar with New York City, you will know that the Upper East Side is a very affluent community. You may also know this if you watch Gossip Girl. Um, and it is right next to the community of East Harlem, um, which is significantly less affluent. And in East Harlem, 23% of residents have diabetes, as, and that is compared to 4% of the residents of the Upper East Side. This is clearly not an issue of food choice. This is an issue of a very unjust food system. Um, and economic inequality. So we, we realized that we could not simply talk about individual food choice. Uh, a second reason that we expanded our focus is that we started to have a better appreciation of the role of culture in food. And while we still emphasize eating fruits and vegetables um, and talking about food that is good for your body, we also really wanted to make sure we were celebrating the diverse food cultures of our students and their city. So that's a second reason that we zoomed out a little past healthy food choice. And the third is what brings me here today, which is that we discovered as in the process of evaluating our program that our 
our work was actually having a very positive impact on students socially and emotionally, um, even though it wasn't originally our, our focus. Next slide, please. So prior to making social emotional learning our focus, which we did um, in the 2021 school year, um, we had done a lot of program evaluation. And here are three big ways that we do it. We do surveys of students and their caregivers. Um, we have in the past done interviews and focus groups with school staff. And our teachers collect quotes and anecdotes about things that kids say or do in class that, that strikes them. Um, and it is through those second two methods that we started to see that we were having this positive impact on students' social emotional learning. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so when we decided that we were gonna have a slightly different destination, that our destination was not just gonna be healthy food choice, um, that it was also going to include social emotional learning, we decided that that was going to be one of the outcomes that we would try to start measuring and um, working more intentionally towards. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I, I collected for you a couple examples of the quotes and anecdotes that we had found prior to 2021, um, where we were starting to see this positive social emotional impact on students. So the first is from a, a student, a fifth grader in our East Harlem school, PS7, time's up already. It goes by so fast when we're having fun. Um, we noticed that the PS311 um, kindergartners in the Bronx cheered when their teacher told them it was time for them to come to cooking class. Uh, we have a quote from a student named Justin saying, we work together so we can finish fast and it will taste very good. And so we saw, okay, well, this is a kid who's realizing the importance of the teamwork that we're doing. And then a, a teacher said, I know it feels like a very safe space for a lot of students. There are always kids hanging out in there during lunchtime and checking in after school. Um, so I say this to you, not, not to brag about our program, but really to show um, what we were starting to see, that we were starting to see that there is this positive social emotional thing happening in our classes. Next slide, please. There is a well-regarded, um, Authority in social emotional learning called CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, and they divide social emotional learning into five domains, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. All right, thank you. Next slide. Um, when I first heard those terms, I thought they were kind of difficult to, to parse, so I wanted to give you a little more detail about what they mean. Um, and then talk about what they mean when we talk about cooking and gardening education. So self-awareness is the ability to understand your own emotions. In other words, knowing how you yourself feel. That's the one that we did just when I asked you guys to do thumbs up, thumbs down. How are you feeling today? Can you, can you get a pulse check on your own self? Self-management is managing your emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. In other words, sort of handling how you feel. So maybe you're not feeling great, but how do you get through that? How do you um, try to work through a, a negative feeling? Um, and how do you have your feelings work for your own betterment? Uh, social awareness is the ability to understand the perspectives of, of and to empathize with others, including those from diverse backgrounds, cultures, and contexts. So in other words, knowing how other people feel. Uh, related to that is relationship skills, the ability to establish and maintain healthy and supportive relationships and to effectively navigate settings with, in, with diverse individuals and groups. So that's working well with others. Um, and lastly, responsible decision making, which is the ability to make caring and constructive choices about personal behavior and social interactions across diverse situations. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we took those competencies and um, molded them to our program, but I, I will pause here to see if anyone has questions just about the general domains of social emotional learning. Okay, so I'm just going to keep going. Oh, sorry, I do see a question. Oh, a good question. What, which of the five competencies are hardest to deal with? Such a great question, biggest issues. Do you mind, Russell, going back to the slide with the five competencies? Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm curious what other people would say about their own experience, but I would say that the ones that we find ourselves working on the most would be the relationship skills, um, because I think working, you know, it's, it's all well and good to manage your own feelings and deal with your own self, but it's when you 
throw 30 young people in a room together with all the feelings, I feel like that can be the most challenging. It's also the one I think we work on. We also maybe, maybe it's hardest also because we rely upon it so much. Um, I'm curious if anyone has a different opinion about what's particularly challenging. And we can, we can come back to that later. That's a great question, thank you. Um, do you mind going two slides ahead, Russell? Oh, actually, yeah, that one, perfect, sorry. <laughs> back, thank you, thank you. So um, we had this generic understanding of social emotional learning, um, but it didn't feel like a perfect fit for what we were doing. And we were lucky enough to work with our sister organization, the Edible Schoolyard of New Orleans, who was um, pretty far ahead of us on this, on this uh, topic. And from them, through conversations, we learned two things that I thought were really helpful. One is how to translate that generic social emotional language learning to a cooking and gardening program. And then also how to use classroom observations to measure and see whether social emotional learning was taking place. Uh, next slide, please. So starting with the first thing, what does social emotional learning look like in the garden and kitchen classroom? So we, we kind of drilled down on this a little bit as we started working on it. So self-awareness, it's how, how you feel that day, but also very specifically, uh, whether being in the kitchen or garden or doing your kitchen and garden tasks uh, changes your feelings for the, you know, hopefully for the better, but whether for the better or for the worse. Um, Self-management, I'd say the way that we most work on that is having, encouraging kids to leave their comfort zone. Um, often it's to try a new food, but it could be to try something new skill-wise, a new cooking skill, a new gardening skill, you know, discomfort being in soil, discomfort with bees or worms. So just trying to get kids to be open to experiences they may not feel excited about at the outset. Um, social awareness, we do a lot of um, work trying to understand uh, social justice issues. And I'd say social awareness comes up most frequently when we are talking about those who bring our food to us, people who work in the food system. Uh, relationship skills, I'd say the way that comes up most, most of the time is that all the collaborative work that we do in our classes, the kids work together a lot when they're, when they're gardening and when they're cooking, but most particularly when they're working together on a recipe. And lastly, responsible decision-making, I'd say the way that we like to see that most is seeing the kids um, show care and respect to all the living things in the garden, whether it's the plants or the insects or the soil itself. Um, next slide, please. And as for trying to figure out whether it's really happening or not, um, we, did, again, relied upon our collaboration with the Edible Schoolyard in New Orleans to pilot an observation tool. So what we learned from them is that they were going into classrooms and they had created a checklist of different social emotional learning attributes that they were looking for and they would observe their teachers and see whether they were seeing these attributes in action. They would observe the teachers and they would observe the students. And so at first we used their observation tool um, to see how our classes were stacking up and some of the major things we were looking for on their a uh, tool were showing support to classmates, taking turns and working collaboratively, taking small risks, displaying joy, pride or ownership, displaying caution and care, expressing feelings and making connections to outside life. Um, next slide, please. So what we found is that we were doing pretty well on five of those um, and the five where we were hitting pretty frequently in our own classes were seeing, we saw a lot of joy and pride and ownership in our students. We certainly were working collaboratively, to, collaboratively together an awful lot. We did see them taking small risks. We did see them display caution and care and we did see them connecting to outside life. So the two that we weren't seeing as strongly were their own expression of their feelings and sort of a more um, specific way of showing support to their classmates. And that's something that the Edible Schoolyard of New Orleans really cultivates through specific activities. So we kind of faced a decision about whether we should be expanding to get, get all of those competencies or deepening. Um, and what we decided was we wanted to keep our lessons very similar to what they, where they had been, but to deepen them. So we felt like we were doing some okay work already, but we could become more intentional and deepen uh, the work that we were doing. 
Um, and the way that we decided to do that was to, for the most part, take our existing lessons and tweak the opening and the closing so that they were more intentional and more uh, explicit about the social emotional learning that the kids would be doing that day. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I am going to go through each of the five competencies and give you guys an example of something from our lessons that hits on each one of them. Uh, but before I do, I'll take a pause again and see if you have any questions now about social emotional learning and what it looks like specifically in, or what it can look like in a garden kitchen setting. Thank you, Tasha, for sharing that super cool. Oh, good question. Russell, are we sharing the slideshow after the presentation? Yes, we are. Thanks. That's awesome. Okay. All right. Um, I'll just go on then. Thank you, guys. Um, so as I said, um, we did a little bit of the self-awareness uh, exercise ourselves. Super simple. Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. Um, this is one that we can apply to a lesson that we do frequently, which is having kids do work in the garden. Um, in New York City, the gardening season is pretty short uh, for the school season. You know, you have a burst of it in the fall and then you have a nice burst of it in the spring. And so when we have nice days and we can get the kids out in the garden, we really like to have them do as much garden work as possible. But we want to make sure that they have, that there's, that there is some specific learning happening. And sometimes it's an academic topic, um, but in this particular instance, we're really emphasizing the social emotional value of doing the garden work. So in this lesson, the opening would be to welcome the students. It would be the asking them how they felt um, at the beginning of class using their thumbs. Um, and then it would simply be to explain the job that, or jobs that they were doing that day. And you can see we do a variety of jobs with the students depending on what's happening with the garden. And then the majority of the class would be the engaging activity itself of the kids working in the garden. Um, may, they may go from station to station. They may do one task the whole time, depending on our space and what what's needs to be done. And then you draw them back together again at the end for a closing and you ask them again how they're feeling. With their thumbs, you can ask them, did, they, did being in the garden change how they felt? Um, and you can talk to them about how for some people being in the garden makes them feel really good. Maybe people like to be in nature, Maybe people like doing something physical. Maybe people like the sense of accomplishment from gardening. So you're helping them understand it, um, how gardening might affect them. You know, it's great if it makes them feel good. We're not out to indoctrinate them, but if we can encourage them to discover things that help them feel good, um, then I think we're helping them with that self-awareness competency. Ah, that's a great question. We have not. I do, we do not chart how they are feeling. Um, and that's a great point. We do, we do measure all kinds of other things, but that would be an interesting one. We've never, we've never quantified that. That's an interesting idea. Thank you for asking that. Um, let's do next slide. Okay, so self-management, um, as I discussed earlier, one of the primary ways that we try to work on self-management with our students is encouraging them to take small risks. And the most frequent version of this is to try a new food, something that they may not be familiar with, something that they might not think they like, or maybe are convinced that they don't like. Um, and I'm using an example of a dish that we made this winter called misirwa, which is an Ethiopian lentil stew. Um, it's, the, it's the center of the plate on, in the slide. Um, the reason I picked it is because we made it at a school where it was a very unfamiliar dish, I think for everybody or nearly everybody. Um, and I think in other ways, it is a challenging dish for students, you know, maybe because of how it looks, maybe because it has strong flavors. Um, and so when we do our opening, we want to, of course, explain what the dish is and give whatever cultural background that we want to give and we need to give cooking instructions, but we also want to lay the groundwork for this um, idea of trying something new and being a brave taster. So you can mention at the beginning, um, most of the period again is dedicated to that hands-on engaging activity of making the dish. Um, and then at the closing, we close most of our cooking classes the same way. We often say in unison, thank you gardeners, thank you cooks. That's a way for the students to acknowledge all the people who helped 
the food get to their table, including themselves. Um, we once again would encourage them to be brave tasters, although we do, we absolutely never force anyone to try anything. Um, and then after they taste it, we ask them what we thought, uh, depending on how many times we've had them or, you know, what kind of expectations we've developed. We may have to remind them of how to discuss that politely if they don't like a dish, but we, we do allow them to share their feedback. Um, the reason I picked it as the postscript is because this turned out to be an incredibly popular recipe. Um, the kids came in frequently to request it, to bring a hot copy of it home. Parents often asked for it. They sent pictures of their kids making it. So it was sort of a runaway hit. And it was something I would say that was was outside of most students' experience to begin with. So I think it's an example of self-management. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so social awareness. Um, in this lesson, this is a lesson that we had actually been doing before we made our shift to emphasizing social emotional learning. Um, but this lesson I think was already all about social awareness, which is to say it's all about empathizing with people's, other people's experience. Um, and so in this particular lesson, I think the entire lesson emphasizes this, this um, competency of social awareness. And it doesn't necessarily have a very specific opening or closing related to social emotional learning. Um, and in this lesson, students work in groups to read the profile of someone who works in the food system. And we have many different profiles, but they often include a farm worker, a delivery worker, a line cook, a fast food worker and someone who works in a food factory. Um, so students work together in groups, they read the story, and then they use a prompt to, a guided worksheet to help them tell that person's story um, in the first person. So included on the worksheet are prompts like my name is, my job is, um, I get food to people's table by, uh, some challenges I face are, and some ways I have fought to make things better are. So kids work together to read the story and retell the story, and then they share the information out about the story to one another. Um, and again, it's the first person that makes this um, an empathy exercise. This is something that we were inspired by uh, through the work of a nonprofit that's called Narrative Four. And, and what that nonprofit does is pair people together, um, sometimes on opposite sides of an issue, um, and they have them tell their story to one another, and then the, they have to tell the other person's story, but they have to tell it in the first person. Um, and I had read about this in New York Magazine about people who have different views about guns telling pretty intense stories about their experiences with guns, and then they have to tell the story of their partner using the first person. And what Narrative 4 has found is that by using the first person, you really are encouraging people to have a little more empathy to someone who they might not have, whose view they might not have considered before. So that's, that is our lesson, um, emphasizing social awareness. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, as I mentioned also earlier, one of, one of the main things that our students had been doing that we felt was working towards SEL all along was working collaboratively in the garden, but most especially during cooking classes. Um, and, I will have to admit to you that when I first started working at Edible Schoolyard NYC, I was worried that the group work was not getting us toward our goal, which I thought at the time was that kids would be very independently capable of getting a meal uh, from store to table or from seed to table. And I worried that because they had, we had classes of 32 kids and they had to work in groups to do everything, that they never really got a chance to make a recipe fully independently from beginning to end. Um, However, as a result of our evaluation work where we started to hear these positive stories about kids learning to work well together, I, I had an aha moment where I understood that of course the working together was its own, um, it was a good in and of itself. And so it's something that we have leaned into now that we've been emphasizing social emotional learning. The kids have to work in groups to prepare food in our classes because that's just the logistical challenge that we face, but why not make that something that is really a special thing that they are learning. Um, and so in this particular recipe, which is for a dish called full madamas, it's an Egyptian um, bean dip. It's similar to hummus, uh, but it uses fava beans instead of garbanzos. Um, in this particular version of the lesson, um, we emphasize the, the benefits of the students working together. 
I apologize, the picture is not a full Madonna's. I think they're making dumplings in that picture, but I just liked that picture, so I put that in. So in the opening statement, um, you're gonna tell students that by taking turns and practicing teamwork, um, that that's, those two things are gonna be a really important part of the recipe and that everyone's gonna have a job to do to make the recipe to complete and that it's everyone's job to help each other. So you're giving kids the challenge of working well together in a group then the majority of the class is spent actually making the recipe, the fool. Um, and then as we do with all cooking classes, we end by thanking the gardeners and thanking the cooks and we share the food. But also in this ending, we thank the students for working well together and for practicing their patience as people took turns to do their part. And if you feel good about it, you can also open the floor to your students to give shout outs to one another who, for people who help each other well, or you can model that by giving shout outs to particular students. Um, and I'm seeing a question about what grades we do the activity with, which I think that question was about the food workers lesson. That is typically a middle school lesson. Um, and these other lessons I can tell you if, if you have questions. Yes, the picture is not a full Madonna's. I think that picture is, I think they're making dumplings. Possibly they're making empanadas in that picture. <laughs> they are making something that is going in a wrapper and full does not go in a wrapper. It's just a dip. Um, next slide, please. I think this is the final of the competencies that we're gonna talk about with a specific example today. Um, this one is the responsible decision-making, which as I mentioned, we what we're trying to do is get the kids to show us that they can um, show care and caution and respect for all the living things in the garden. Um, and this particular lesson is about the Haudenosaunee address. So in this lesson, the students are learning about the Haudenosaunee uh, and they are an alliance of tribes who are indigenous to New York state, although farther upstate from us in, in New York city. And in this lesson, they read an excerpt of a speech uh, from that alliance. And in that speech, um, the pe people are offering gratitude to many things, uh, including the earth, and including the plants that provide us food. Um, and one thing that comes through clearly in the address is um, the belief of the Haudenosaunee that the earth cares for people and that people in turn have to care for the earth. So that's a big chunk of the lesson. Um, and then um, we tell the students that they are gonna practice care for the earth by doing some garden jobs and that depends on what needs to be done in the garden. So they go off and do their garden jobs and then they come back and then we ask them to tell us the different ways that they cared for the earth. So that one is again, another, an example of something that we do all the time, which is having the kids do garden jobs. But in this particular instance, we are encouraging them to see that as a way of, their, of improving their own responsible decision-making. So um, I think, can I see the next slide, Russell? Okay, excellent. Can you go back to the previous? Thank you. All right, so before we go into breakout rooms, um, I'm going to pause and, and for questions, but I see there are some in the chat. Um, have all the lessons I mentioned so far been geared towards middle schoolers? I only the, um, only the food worker lesson is specifically geared towards middle schoolers. The garden jobs and the recipes, we teach pretty much every age from three-year-olds through eighth grade, which is the age range that we teach with adaptations depending on, on the age. Um, Haudenosaunee Address, the one I just did, that actual reading we do with third graders. Um, although I, I think you could definitely do it older. Um, yes, I can share the recipes and also the lessons that I've mentioned. How is the how are the relationship skills between children and nature being developed? Oh, that's a great question. So I think it's I think it's a work in progress. I think that we are the stage that we're at right now is simply to acknowledge um, and have help students to see that they are having that they can have that kind of positive interaction with the garden and that is a way of, of caring for nature. Oh, trees. I believe trees are definitely thanked in the Haudenosaunee address. Um, I will have to review the address before I can say that for sure, but I think trees are the earth, different kinds of plants. Uh, do we receive resistance from students when lessons call for reading and writing? 
yes, we do. <laughs> um, and how do we manage this resistance? Well, I think this is, a, this is definitely a challenge that we face. Um, I would say we do it in two, three ways. One is um, we try whenever possible to have the reading and writing be one component of the lesson and make sure there's still the hands-on gardening or cooking component that they tend to favor happening the lesson. So one way we do it is try not to have it be the entire lesson. Um, a second way that we do it is try to, sometimes we make it a gallery walk or like we did with the food workers, like you're doing it together in a group um, so that it just makes it a little less like sitting at your desk and reading something. It's not a night and day difference, but sometimes just getting up and walking around to read something or reading it with your small group can make it a little more palatable. In the case of the Hadnasani address, which we just did, um, the kids have a copy of it, and if, if they're resistant to reading it themselves, the teacher might read it aloud and, and give them the opportunity to follow along. Um, reflect back on the observation tool. I would say with the observation tool, using it over time um, and getting enough observations in to see what patterns you're seeing is the most helpful. Um, so we were able, we probably conducted uh, over 50 observations when we did it and that, and we're able to see um, over time and over different teachers and over different sites, which uh, competencies were being hit. Um, I'd say a way to make it more effective that we haven't done, but I think the Edible Schoolyard of New Orleans did is um, you would have two people do the observation and, and um, I forget the fancy evaluation word for it, but make sure they're on the same page for what they're seeing. I think that would make it even stronger. Um, we do some lessons about climate um, and some lessons about, about gratitude, yes. Um, weather, yes, I suppose weather a little bit, probably seasonality more than weather. I think I'm gonna move on from questions for now. These are awesome questions, thank you. I think we will definitely have time at the end, but I wanna, um, go to breakout rooms. Um, Russell, do you mind going to the next slide? Okay, so um, we're gonna put you in breakout rooms of four or five people. And what I'd love for you guys to do is um, share out in your breakout rooms and take turns. So I would love for one person to, to start and share a way that they would like to see their students grow in their social emotional learning, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, responsibility decision-making, blah, blah. Um, so what's one area where you wanna see your students grow? What are some challenges that you face or anticipate facing or some ideas that you already have about that? So one person can present where they want to go and where they are maybe struggling or where they already have ideas and then the group can offer some feedback. Um, I'm thinking maybe three to five minutes per person and then and you rotate. Um, I'm gonna see if I can put that prompt right here in the chat for you guys. See if I effectively cut and paste it. Oh, I did, look at me. Um, any questions about that before we do the breakout rooms? If not, Russell, I'm ready for breakout rooms. Hey, I right, think you think everyone's back, Russell? I think so, yeah. Awesome. Welcome back, you guys. I hope that you had good discussions in your breakout rooms. Um, I would love to hear from you if you would be willing to share out, um, if you had any interesting ideas that were shared about incorporating social emotional learning, any challenges that you guys were chewing over. Um, so please either come off mute and shout it out or put your hand up, whatever you feel comfortable with. Well, I think if there are not more questions, should I turn it back to you, Russell, for survey, et cetera? Sure, sounds good. Um, well, I'm first, before we go to the survey, I would love if we could all come off a of mute and give some appreciation and gratitude to Liza for holding space and presenting on this conversation today. So thank you, Liza, so much. So 